cost of governance refers to the expenses incurred by the government to run its administrative machinery and provide essential services to the citizens. In Nigeria, this cost has skyrocketed over the years, prompting concerns about the implications. But what are these implications? Let's break it down, everyone. I'm being joined by an economy expert and the co-founder of Budget. Thank you so much, Mr. Sean Onigbine, for joining us. He joins us virtually from Lagos. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Now, we've been talking about the uh, policy directions of the uh, Bola Tinubu administration. But for your own, from your own point of view and for you, what comes out to you that they've done, uh, perhaps one that is right and one that is wrong that you think uh, that you'd like to speak on tonight? I think um, they've done a few things, uh, passed some uh, laws. Um, the most, two most important things have been done. Um, the removal of first subsidy, um, that's the major one. Um, we also know that the um, the exchange rate parity um, is also something that has been done. Uh, the, in my own view, the market is still going through a process of discovery, um, so we don't even have the final price point yet. But we're already seeing that um, the gap between the parallel market and the higher end has closed. But I think that's something that is necessary. It's very clear that um, a lot of producers, a lot of man Manufacturers are heavily dependent, dependent on the parallel markets, um, and and so at this time there are just a few select uh, people who are who are using the CBN um, um, to to benefit themselves. So I mean that parity is is on its way, and I think that's good for Nigeria. More money from far to to state governments uh, because the exchange rate has has changed. Also means that certain things will change. Our GDP ratios in dollar terms, our revenue to the to GDP will also change. Some of those things will also differ um, significantly. But I feel that's necessary. Um, but we will still have to continue to watch that space. The other one on the subsidy, well, I mean, that's been chewed, that's been discussed, and I think Nigerians, most Nigerians have come to a consensus that first subsidy has to go. And it's not just because it has to go, it's because we can no longer just pay for it. We we'll use foreign debt, euro bonds, we we'll use domestic debt, We've used oil revenue, we've used domestic crude account, we've, we've taken from the excess crude account. Um, we just don't have any other money. I mean, we can't keep borrowing for such consumption. So, um, But my own idea is what on the other side? Citizens are bearing the brunt. Um, they have accepted to some extent and um, given this government some pushing for 48 naira to a dollar, uh, 48 naira per liter, 50 naira per liter. They have accepted those figures. But there are also constraints and there are also concerns that. Is the government also playing fair by them? Is the cost of governance going down? Uh, are they being honest with them? Because if you put all the burden on the side of the citizen, uh, that is unfair. What exactly is the burden uh, of government in this regard? So I think those are the questions that are on the table. And uh, I think, and we can see that that's quite germinating on social media that people are beginning to ask. There has to be also um, reduction in the cost of governance and how or exactly the way government does business. So let's get into the issues of cost of governance. And I mean, we can no longer debate whether or not uh, it costs highly to run government in Nigeria. And uh, those who also uh, argue that, look, the, the, the multiplicity of the agencies of government perhaps doing the same thing is a, a cause for worry. Um, let, let's look at that for a, for a moment before we look at aspect of the lives of the executive that need to be pruned because we can no longer uh, afford as a people a exorbitant and extravagant lifestyle of those who are in government so from your own point of view uh, multiplicity of agencies of government and their duties and roles if you have a few examples of the ones to scrap and the ones to merge which ones would you mention tonight? I think um, we have to go back to the oral side reports and also look at what that um, um, person, what I mean, uh, was a respected civil servant. So he's had his own time in government and he gave us a report 
Um, he identified the agencies for us. He asked us to look at ICPC and EFCC and ask if their rules are not similar and if there is no, if there is a need for us to merge them together. Some agencies um, were, talk, were supposed to be talked in, into um, into the line ministry so that they stop being standalone agencies. Um, but there, there are bigger problems here. Between, the, the, I mean, but when the Rosai report was published, Nigeria has, I mean, if you look at almost the, the, the National Assembly, over 60% of the bills in the National Assembly are establishment bills. So constantly we are establishing new agencies, new, um, new, new things just to make sure that we, you know, we have development go around the country. Everybody wants to put some form of federal government presence in their community. Um, and that's a big problem. So in my own view, there are agencies that we need to go back to and ask ourselves if this is necessary or not. But you ask me is that we have to do another appraisal of the Rosario report. We have to look at the new agencies that have been created and ask ourselves, is this, is this, are these things necessary? We have research institutes. And it's not just, the, and it's not just about, are they necessary? Do, should they draw revenue uh, or their earnings from the government? I mean, are we supposed to just put them in a standing you know, situation where they should fend for how they should earn you know, their, their, their revenue? So why should they draw revenue from the federal costs? So agencies can be on that kind of mood where they are not, they are not in any way a body to the federal government. So, but it has to be a form of surgical appraisal of things to be sure that yes, we need these agencies. If we need these agencies, we know how many number of people do we need in those agencies? Because when we look at cost of governance, I, I see it in three ways. I see um, the lifestyle of public officials first, as when we talk about cost of government, that people see uh, a government official movie, maybe 20, 25 car convoy, yes. Or people see you buying um, in newspapers or, you know, um, beyond a reasonable, for, for not just reasonable in amount, or they figure out our travel, the contingent you travel with. But you look at the overheads of government and the lifestyle of government. I mean, every time they're buying brand new cars for ministers, for head of agencies and things like that, people want to see that and say, you can't have people struggling. I mean, Nigerians, you know, going through it hard and a difficult time right now. And you have those in public office launching <laughs> or enjoying themselves. So that's, that perception has to be something that has to be clear, you know. And the other part is also the, the agencies and ministries that draw funds from the public treasury, how many are they? Do we need to close some down? Do we need to open some up? And the third part is the cost of public contracting. Are we certain that we have looked at public contracting surgically and asked ourselves if something costs 10 naira in the public market, should it not cost 10 naira in, 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 in government and documentation? And that's the kind of thing people look at. The way I see public cost of governance, you want to ensure that there is no waste in how public officers conduct themselves. You want to be sure that there is no waste now we pay people who are unproductive or agencies that are not necessary to exist or to exist as a department or should stop drawing revenues or resources from the federal government. And you want to be also sure that, um, you know, we don't do public contracting the way we are doing it. Because at the end of the day, we keep borrowing money, we keep putting ourselves in a lot of debt, and we ask ourselves, if I spend 70 trillion naira over a period of eight years, you know, did I get 70 trillion naira worth of, you know, investment or payment into government, into government personnel? So that's the questions that we have to bring to the table. In all of efficiency is required now from the Nigerian government, you know, if the people would actually trust their motives for what they are doing. So, I mean, there are a few um, information you put up here in some of this, uh, the information on the, on the slides that, uh, that I, you shared with me earlier. Uh, I mean, could you shed light on a few? I mean, you talked about project outside NDA's mandate, and there are a few of them. Uh, maybe it can be an example of what you were talking about, is it? Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's something that, you, you know, the former National Assembly... Um, um, the Ninth National Assembly is an anomaly that crept in. You know, before we had the constituency project, which is an 100, 100 billion um, naira, um, and every National Assembly member puts whatever they like in their pocket, and some of them do street lights, some of them do roads, some of them do empowerment projects. But we don't agree with that. We, don't, we think that, it should, that situation is flawed. But an anomaly has now crept in, and which is really, really dangerous. And I hope um, President Bolatunu would you know, would hear this and would pay attention to it because you know everybody 
because you sit in an agency, for example, you might sit in a committee as a member of the National Assembly overseeing NIPSS, which is a, a policy and strategic outfit, you know, based in Kurujos. Then you stuck in a road construction in Alimosho local government. How is an agency in Kuru supposed to be doing road construction? Right. How is, you know, those are the situations. So, so you, you gave this example. Let, let, let's look at this example. Uh, mm -hmm. you, Federal College of Dental Technology and Therapy, Enugu. You gave the example of Federal Polytechnic Ukana Akwai Bomb. Uh, can you give us a vivid example of how this is detrimental? You know, because if an agency does not have the mandate or the technical expertise um, to do certain things, at the end of the day, what you get is just waste. You know, um, who's going to prepare the bill of quantities? Who is going to ascertain that the project is, is done to the, to, at the level of value for money? The team or the organization doesn't have the capacity or the mandate to do that. And we've spoken about this, that it is extremely wrong for people, especially at the National Assembly and also at the executive, they're also, they're also guilty of it, to just talk in projects in the budget in an appropriate manner. Like you now put the whole of pressure on the executive, including the accountant general's office and the budget officer, say this project must be executed. I mean, we are spending billions of naira on this kind of things. And I pray that in the 10th National Assembly, such things do not happen. And the only way it you know, would not happen is that the executive will not incentivize it. You put those projects into the budget, then the executive should not implement them. I mean, but in a situation where you find that a, a border community development association is constructing roads, you know, somewhere community in the part of, I mean, it's, it just doesn't make sense. So, um, Mr. Onibin, there, there so when, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I looked at uh, the issue of the debt profile and what the DMO has said, and they, they said, look, for Nigeria not to enter into trouble, and uh, first and foremost, there's a warning by the DMO about and the manner in which this present government should take on the issue of debt and borrowings. Uh, mm -hmm. They've cautioned the, the Tunubu government not to go ahead and borrowing extravagantly, and they've also said that, look, we need to make a, a certain margin of revenue generation if we can match, uh, match the, the ratio of debt servicing and revenue generation or the GDP ratio any of these that if you're not careful we're going to enter into trouble i don't know if you saw that communication from the dmo i, I saw it and i think it was professional i felt like that's what we expect of public agencies um they should be able to say the facts irrespective of, uh, of who's interested or who cares about it and i'm happy that they were able to say this um this is not even the final position of our debt i feel we, we hold more than this the time when all the ways and means kick in and all of that, I mean, sure, public debt will be higher than this. The, the thing is that um, we are, our, our revenue is a huge problem, and our efficiency in terms of spending is another problem. And those are the examples I was making previously. But we have a poor revenue structure, and the only way we have to be able to do that is to, one, optimize what needs to be collected. Um, to also look at uh, specifically on our, you know, the tax waivers that we are giving to various agencies, trillions of naira. We had an event on fiscal options and opportunities for this new government. And a huge point was about federal government gives too many waivers generously. Some of them are not necessary. Some of them are even destructive for those industries where the waivers have been given. I mean, those kind of appraisals need to happen. And they now have to now give the riot act to different revenue agencies especially um, um, revenue generating agencies to, to be able to do with more efficiency. Um, so our revenue, if you look at our debt to GDP, is still within permissible levels. But if you look at our revenue, when you look at debt servicing numbers, and compare that to revenue, it's outrageous. I mean, it's beyond, it's beyond normal level. I've not seen any financials of any country in every respectable country, I mean, that's spending around 80 to 90% of its, of its revenues, especially at the federal level. On, on, on debt servicing debt. Yeah, for, yeah. Around that. yeah. So, um, two, two quick questions so that we can, we can anchor. One is uh, appointments we, uh, are going to be made. Uh, in fact, there are those uh, of the view that some ministries are supposed to be matched with another, and not at this time that Nigeria is at a crossroad where we need to manage your resources, especially the running of government. If there are ministries that you think could be made, the appointments are going to be made. 
and sat satisfying the federal character, every state will have to have a minister that is looking at maybe more than 36 uh, ministers that will be appointed. Uh, but, I uh, mean, can we show that some of this burden is not too much? And which of these ministry, if you are to advise, can, can be matched for, to cut down uh, cost of governance? Um, thank you so much. Uh, Unless you're speaking, uh, matching ministries, it's a good idea. Um, I think we did power works and housing, and somehow that didn't work out. I think the, the, the major problem is the size of ministers. Somehow, somehow, we need to go back to that constitution and say we don't need 36 ministers. We could do well with 20 ministers. And uh, when we are honest about it, because at the end of the day, even if we match ministries, we still create a cascade of uh, the super minister, minister of state one, minister of state two, um, and things like that. I mean, some of those things are unnecessary. For example, it's all about even managing the ministry. We just need less people and the ministry. We, need, we have a minister of education, we have a minister of education, a minister of health, we have a minister of health. There's no point having a minister of state for education, minister of state for health. For what purpose? You know, um, minister of labor and productivity should just be made of labor and productivity. The ministries are, are, are tightly fitted to some extent. The question is that we just need one person to man them each and or and one woman or woman to lead them and, and that's what it should be not us having a minister but i think um, barrister festoski also mentioned about you know the abnormality somewhere around the minister of state i pray but this is a constitutional issue it looks like the president's hands will be tied but he can he can set up the zone it could be simple right. as president will appoint three persons from at least from every geopolitical zone and i think that's just that's just fair enough well, we hope that things will move in the right direction. But thank you so much, indeed, Mr. Sean Oningbide, an economic expert and a co-founder of Budget. Thank you so much, indeed, for your thought tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you.